I'm absolutely delighted to actually be hosting this in uh, young Peter's absence, who sends his apologies. As someone who has a, a personal involvement in four MGAs myself, of which none of them actually have a digital strategy. So I'm hoping to learn something. So if I can just put, hand you straight over to Paula Doolan um, for the introductions. Thank, Thank you, you, Paula. Thank you very much. So yes, I'm Paula Doolan, and I'm Sales Director at Instanda, and you're all very welcome, and as uh, Jeff said, on such a sunny day, but at least we, it's lovely and cool here today. Um, so the briefing today is, what does a digital strategy look like for an MGA, and why it is important that you have one? Um, first of all, if you look at the slide there, it's the learning objectives, and by the end of the session, we hope... Um, you will have understood, understand what a digital strategy is and why MGAs, you can read it there yourselves. And this is um, to make sure that you get your CPD points. So those of you in the audience that know me um, would agree that before joining in Standa, I wouldn't have been known in the uh, insurance tech space. Indeed, ladies and gentlemen, I would not have been known in the tech space at all. Um, however, I have been a long time in the insurance market, in the Lloyds and London market, and I've seen a lot of changes, albeit at a snail's pace, particularly in the Lloyds and London market, may I add. But having joined in Standa, I'm absolutely amazed at the creativity and the rapid pace of change, um, and I can't believe it's taking place in the tech industry. And so I too am looking forward to our speakers today. Our first speaker is a guest of Instanda, and I'd like to, we're delighted to have you, Paolo, with us, Paolo Cuomo, and he will touch on this very subject, the rapid growth in the technology space, and indeed, what lies ahead. Paolo is COO of Charles Taylor Managing Agents, and he also is co-convener of um, Instech London, and this was founded in 2015, and it offers an ecosystem for innovators, insurance practitioners and investors to engage in discussions around technology-driven insurance innovation. He also tells me that he never really wanted to join the financial service or insurance sector, a bit like all of us really, um, and before joining he spent much of the previous uh, 10 years doing exotic work in the retail sector, particularly at Sainsbury's. He helped um, innovate and refining the way Sainsbury stacks its fruit and vegetables and was the champion in the eyes of the night shift workers by adding coloured stripes to the hundreds of identical brown boxes that fill the store freezer. So always an innovator. Our second speaker is Tim Hardcastle and Tim is our chairman and CEO of Instanda. A career in FTSE 100 and 250 businesses involved Tim in leading several programs of technology-enabled change. Time as CIO at Hiscox, plus consulting programs for the likes of Chubb, AJG and JLT, amongst others, schooled him in the specific technology challenges faced by the insurance industry today. Tim's mantra is, there has to be a better way. And the insights gained from first-hand experience led Tim to create the entirely new business and service model that is in Standa. Yes, Tim is a risk taker, but you don't know he's also a boy racer. He spends his time, um, well, a lot of his time at the weekends, racing motorbikes and cars. And I heard on the grapevine this morning that he also breaks the British speed limit on the ski slopes regularly. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Paolo to the podium to start his presentation. Good afternoon. Yes, before Tim gets the chance to talk about digital strategy, I'm going to remind us why we need one, given the, the, the chaos. A little bit before we get to this slide, though, on me. So, I am CEO of Charles Taylor Managing Agency. Briefly, for those of you who will have heard of Charles Taylor but aren't quite aware of what we do, we do a whole load of things, and that could take a whole 20 minutes in and of itself. But two that might be interesting... We do now run a turnkey managing agency. So those of you that have found running an MGA too easy and want to take on being a new syndicate in Lloyd's, let us know. We also have Charles Taylor Insurance Services that offers an increasing number of services into the MGA sector. So Chris over there will answer all those questions if you have any. So 2014, the insurance technology space. So this is not IT insurance. This is Sorry, this is not IT technology, it's technology in the broadest sense. So this is about 
how we use and acquire data. This is about customer interaction through technology. This is smarter ways of knowing your customer. This is about better claims management and fraud detection. Back in 2014, we weren't doing many exciting things. And a number of us sat there and said, look, there has to be something going on. Let's find out. So what we did is we created a group called Insight and invited people to come and talk about what they were doing in terms of sort of new technology in the sector. And nobody turned up. And we thought, OK, it's not just us, because we figured maybe lots of people were doing exciting things and we were just missing out on the party. But no, there wasn't any real feel that things were happening. And we looked to our left and to our right, and there was a group called Startup Bootcamp that was the newest, biggest, coolest accelerator, and they were purely focusing on what they called FinTech. And they thought that anything to do with insurance was kind of really less relevant and less exciting. There's a group called New Finance that would drag 50 or 100 people each month into a dark bar in the basement near Leadenhall Street and they'd all talk again about fintech and they'd talk about 27 different ways to cut down the cost of cross-currency border payments, cross-border currency payments. Um, and whenever anyone tried to talk about insurance, everyone just yawned and went to the bar for another drink. So we're like, okay, what are we going to do? And we said, fine, we need to drive the change. And so we created something called Instech London and we started saying, hey, let's, let's see that everything these fintech people are doing, why can't we do it in the insurance space? In parallel, Startup Bootcamp said, let's do an insurance accelerator. And they went out looking for people who were brave, bold startups ready to actually go for it. And then, in 2015, it just grew and it grew and it grew and it grew and it grew. And I won't talk you through each of these points. But what happened was people started talking about this topic of insure tech separate to fintech. They started running events. They started making investments. The likes of Viva and AXA got involved. And it just got bigger and bigger and bigger and busier. At the top, you see companies called CB Insights and Venture Scanner. They started tracking the insure tech sector as a new space because previously they'd always had a little addendum in any of their reports. So as well as all this fintech stuff, there's this little bit of insure tech. The moment there was tens and hundreds of millions of investment, they started taking this seriously. And the latest Venture Scanner report has some 800 companies they define as insure companies, by which they mean companies that are trying to do something in the insurance space using technology smarter. And it hasn't slowed down. Oh, that's important, actually. Lloyd. So Lloyd, to, to your point, has always maybe been a little bit more conservative in a lot of this space. Lloyd's last November ran a big, shiny event up on the 11th floor. They had the editor of Wired magazine come and be the convener. And it was really a, OK, we as a marketplace need to start thinking about how these new technologies in the broader sense can make a difference. We don't have a clue how, but we have 30,000 people engaged in the market, and someone somewhere there is hopefully going to have some ideas. So it's very encouraging for Lloyd to say, let's start thinking about it. And then 2016 just carried on, events, 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 and then bang there in the middle, I support Tom. So even the Tom program, which in many ways is a sort of solid, stable program about taking the ways we work in the London market and making them a little bit more modern has also now branched out. So there's something called the London Market Innovation Council that has been given the brief to think about what the new technologies mean for the future. So the Innovation Council is running proof of concept on blockchain. It's running proof of concept on drone usage in the, in the claim space. And so actually there's a real formal push from within the market to take all this seriously. Now, a question people ask is, why now? Why did this not happen five years ago? Why is it not going to happen in five years' time? And this relates a bit to the, the, the why you need a digital strategy. So I see it as, as six themes. The growth of fintech. Fintech as an idea has been growing for the last five or six years, and it's got mature enough that actually the smart investors and the smart innovators are starting to say, well, we can't just club everything to do with banking together as fintech. What about the other bits? InsureTech being one bit of it. RegTech, short for regulation technology, is another bit. And we've got the Reg UK gentlemen sitting at the back who have said, hang on, there's an opportunity, and they're using technology to make regulation one of the boorest topics in the world more efficient and more effective. And that's you know, really the time to make a difference. Suppliers grew up a bit. They've been selling the same old IT systems for the past 20, 30, 40, 50 years. They realized that they needed to differentiate a bit. They started thinking smarter about data, smarter about customer interaction, smarter about new technology. And then macro tech trends. So in the last few years, undoubtedly, some of you have given a drone to your godson for Christmas. Or your daughter will have come home from school having made a 3D printed flower. 
things that would never previously have happened started to happen. You've engaged with those topics. We've all started to engage with those topics. And Pokemon Go, of course, has suddenly explained to everyone what augmented reality is. I have a slide later where I used to have to try and explain augmented reality, and it never really worked. Now I don't need to. I just say Pokemon Go, and the 75% of you that are cool enough know what I'm referring to. <laughs> On the demand side, what happened? Increased awareness of tech. If you're an underwriter, you've been sitting at the box doing DNO cover for the last 40 years, and you pretty much know your space. And then someone comes along and says, "Well, what about the cyber impact? Or what about DNO cover for the guy building the driverless car?" Suddenly, you've got to start thinking about that. The use of drones on the claim side has suddenly woken up the claims people and the underwriting managers to actually hear the fundamentally new technology. Big data hangover. So. If you think about it, no one really has mentioned big data for the last 18 months because we're all a little bit embarrassed about how much noise we made about it three years ago and it never really got anywhere. But what's happening now that we've all sort of admitted that we overhyped it a bit is actually the real big data stuff is now happening. Uh, machine learning, better storage, telematics to drive more data. Actually amazing things are happening at the moment. We're doing it a little bit more quietly and a little bit more focused on the output rather than just making noise. And then finally, the awareness of fintech. So, Terms like unicorn or even fintech itself was yeah, never mentioned a year or so ago. Now, if you open City AM in the morning, the FT in the morning, there's always some article on fintech. You know, how is Brexit going to destroy the 20 billion fintech market in London was on page three of City AM this morning. So we're now talking about this. That's driving the demand. That's driving the engagement. And then the final page, <laughs> before Tim then has to work out how you actually put some strategy around this chaos, is just seven of the technologies that, that we're seeing. Within the London Market Innovation Group, one of our main focuses is to educate everyone in the, the market or the broader insurance space about what these technologies are. Similarly, with InsureTech London, sorry, with InsTech London, we're running all sorts of events. Now, there's 50, 100 different types of technology. If we try and go through all those, people just can't cope. So we pick seven that we think are really going to make a difference and that people should at least understand well enough to explain to to someone who asks. So telematics, we all get telematics, we've heard about it. Even if we haven't got our 18-year-old son getting a discount on the car insurance because of it, we're aware of it. The question is how can telematics move beyond cars, into ships, into planes, etc. Robotic process automation is incredibly boring but incredibly useful. It's just the idea of saying wherever you see a human being rekeying, let's teach a computer to do that rekeying. We all know we want to join all our systems up and we know that often it's too expensive to join some systems up. Actually, relatively cheaply, you can train a robot to do the electronic equivalent of typing data that's in one system into another system. And that starts to be really useful when you just want a stopgap for a couple of years as you look to upgrade your systems. And Tim may well touch on some of that. Augmented reality. So for those of you who haven't downloaded Pokemon Go yet, augmented reality is a concept that you can look at the real world and then you can add information on top of it. So if you go to a claim scene and you've got an image of it, you can then start to add information that when someone back in the home office is looking at the video, they've also got the information sitting there. And those of you who've watched CSI will have seen that kind of thing. But that is going to make a fundamental difference to the underwriting journey if you're underwriting a new risk that you don't understand the claims journey when you've got a physical situation that you want to start to annotate. Machine learning, which used to be called AI, then became machine learning, is now called cognitive computing. By the time we meet again, it will be called something else. But effectively, it's the idea that you can teach a computer to think like a human. So instead of just following the black and white rules that computers have been following for 35 years, and just because they go really, really fast, they can do jobs better than us, you actually teach them to think in a human-style way, which means if you say to the computer, of these 20,000 policy documents, how many of them refer to cyber, it doesn't just go and do the equivalent of a control F and look for the word cyber. It has learnt what, what elements of the policy document relate to cyber and it can come back and give you a much more insightful view around your cyber risk based on all these policies. Blockchain is one of these things that I wish we didn't talk about but has somehow become part of the zeitgeist and we, we need to mention it. Blockchain is a, a, a technology that in the future will make a massive difference because it will create what's called distributed ledgers, which means instead of one big old database that you've had in your organization for 20 years, someone else has a big old database they've had for 20 years, and you go through all sorts of pain communicating, we put everything on the blockchain and suddenly everyone can read the data and think. That's a bit out there. A lot of people are getting a little bit too excited in the short term about um, the change it can make, but it's one to keep an eye on. 
Internet of Things, most people have heard of but aren't really aware what it is. Basically, it's just the idea of let's stick a sensor on everything and know what's going on. Everything from lampposts being able to measure the pollution levels in a very localised area through to understanding exactly what's happening to your cargo container as it's crossing the Pacific. And so the combination of the volume of data that's coming from the in Internet of Things, better computing power, machine learning, there's people who are saying we can get rid of the actuaries, we can get rid of the underwriters. We'll see how that plays out. And then finally, the easiest one to understand, because we've all engaged in somewhere or other, is just drones. But, you know, what's useful about drones? Drones in the claims process are already being shown to make a massive difference. If you lose a, if you have damage to a whole load of roofs because of a hailstorm, you can actually stick a drone up there and it can get a sense of what's going on in half an hour, rather than having a person have to climb onto every single roof individually. And that could start to fundamentally change the efficiency of understanding the claim process. And then it go one stage further, and I was talking to a couple of people beforehand when we were eating the sandwiches, that the chap at Imperial College who's taken a small drone, he's taken a small 3D printer, he's stuck the printer on the bottom of the drone and he flies around filling up holes in pipes or holes in roofs and says, look, that again is just fundamentally changing the process from a damaged pipe which may have required five hours to build the scaffolding, someone to climb up, someone to fix it, can suddenly be resolved by a drone in a matter of minutes. And that starts to have real economic value. So that's the chaos of where technology is taking us. Tim will now tell us how to build a strategy to work out what our priorities are. Good luck. <laughs> thank you. Uh, nothing like a nice segue and a <laughs> bit of a challenge. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming on this uh, rather hot day. Um, so uh, the quote on the page, I don't know how many of you know Mary Henley. She was a big contributor to Gestalt uh, psychology. Gestalt psychology is uh, trying to understand the laws of our ability to acquire and maintain meaningful perceptions in a chaotic world. So I think that's where we are. I think there is, as we've heard from Paolo, uh, rather large amounts of froth, of chaos, of noise around technology. I think overall it's a positive thing, but I think it's very difficult to discern how does one go about making the most of it. And that's what I'll try and, I'll try and uh, help you navigate some of that in the next 15, 20 minutes. So, Paula had just identified uh, a little bit of background about me. I would like just to know a couple of questions for you. How many in the audience are uh, involved in running MGAs, just in the audience? I'm expecting quite a large number, given it's an MGA event. So there's about 50%. Can I ask that those members of the audience, everyone else that's not involved in the MGA, uh, to what extent do you feel that your success, because the MGA industry has grown dramatically in, in recent years. To what extent do you feel your success has been about your ability to be responsive, uh, reacting to the market, understanding around you know, what you need to do to meet your needs of your clients, whether those are the brokers or the uninsured? So of those 50% of the audience that said they are running MGAs, how many of you think you've been successful because you're agile? Probably about, well, about another 50%. Okay. Well, my message to you, gentlemen and ladies, is that that agility will serve you well over the next few years because as you've heard from Paolo, uh, change is coming and it's coming at a rather fast pace. Um, so the challenge is, as we look uh, uh, to the future, how are we going to uh, deal with this? So I'm going to try and take you through a little journey. Um, the thumbnail is uh, a little bit about me briefly, just to add on to Paula's comments. Uh, I was a CIO, first of all, in 1999 at the height of the business boom. Um, uh, and my first question then from the board was, what is all this e-business noise and why can't we get some of it because the world's changing? And there was a level of chaos and uh, not panic, but um, uh, I suppose there was a level of expectation that the world would change. And I feel that's where we are today. But my message to you would be this, and Paolo has highlighted it, there are fundamental differences now than there were in 1999. The technology in large part works now. It didn't in 1999. And the second part of it is the technology is so much cheaper. So when you think about your future and what you're able to do, you're going to be able to access these things much more easily. So we'll talk a bit about what is a digital strategy in a minute. I will advise that you should look at the world through a framework because as you heard from Paolo, when you're looking at 800 new technologies and thinking about how that might apply to you, it's almost impossible to discern just by looking at it as a morass what's relevant. So I'll share with you a framework. I would urge you to apply your, your attitude and your aptitude that you've shown so far in terms of your business growth around how honest you are with what you can achieve and do you apply a level of skepticism to what you see out there, particularly from consultants. 
Um, do exploit the technology that's available. I'll share that with you, some ideas, and also make sure that you try and do some experiments. So let's talk a bit about what is a digital strategy. Have people got any views in the audience that they have a good view of what a digital strategy is? <coughs> I will let you into a secret. Exactly. <laughs> You've all already got one. Uh, digital uh, was first invented in the World War II. So we all think about moving from analog to digital but data has been moved around digitally since the world, Second World War. So your businesses today are conducting their operations, moving data around. Your businesses have a strategy. It's clearly effective because you've been growing. So to some extent or other, your, your strategy is already, to a degree, digitized and digital. I think what's interesting is that what you'll be hearing a lot about is that for many, digital strategy will be defined as something to do with uh, engaging new customers, networks, uh, through social media to attract it through using some of those tools such as Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. Uh, the argument will go that it's a, a, a listen and respond model. And it's, a, it's true that we have more tools and techniques around today than we ever had before and it's much more possible for you to reach a greater audience through the digital media that we have. But digital is much bigger than that. It's about the way in which you run your business and the way in which you actually start to think about how you can engage. So let me give you an example. It's not in the insurance space. So part of our group, we have a consulting arm. They work with other companies outside of insurance. Uh, one of the world's largest professional membership bodies, uh, the ACCA, uh, it operates in 60 countries. For those of you that know the finance industry um, profession, the ACCA is a finance qualification that you gain. The way that their business used to operate was they would send exam papers out to global centers all over the world. Those exam papers would get marked and scanned and returned. The transformation for ACCA that we've helped them with is they see themselves as a digital business. What they've done is they've actually automated their operations. They've actually delivered out data to their global centers. So they are now a digital business. It's not about a digital strategy. It's actually about the way that they run things. It's much bigger than social media and engaging with their members. It's about actually looking at all of their operations, uh, their marketing strategies, the way that they collaborate internally with their teams. Another example, one of our other clients uh, is a uh, market operator for the water industry. So the water industry is going to be embracing competition next year. So for those of you that are businesses in the room, you'll be able to choose your water provider. The market operator is a clearing house, effectively a settlement house, uh, that's going to organize the billing and settlement between the water incumbents and the new entrants. That business that we've helped them with around their digital strategy, again, is similar. They see themselves as a digital business because they're moving information around. They don't see themselves as having a digital strategy on top of what they normally do. It's about defining themselves in a way that's the most efficient using data in the right way and giving them scale at low cost. So our argument would be, and we'll talk a little bit later, I'll give you some specific examples of some work we've done with insurance companies in the sector to show what their digital strategy is about. But I wanted to draw those analogies because it's a big message to you to say you're already doing something with digital in your businesses because you're working with data. And I think the thing for the challenge for many of the insurers, MGAs, is to think about their business in a more digital, uh, in, in integrated way, rather than thinking about a bolt-on strategy that you somehow come up with because you're going to, uh, you feel you have to get involved in some of the social media. So uh, let's have a look at the uh, framework that I mentioned that I think you should be using to start to look at how you could best apply some of the technologies that are around in the marketplace. Uh, I like frameworks um, only because if they're simple to understand, then um, they can be used quite easily. So this is a framework that we use for ourselves and when we're working with other clients. So basically, the premise behind this framework, and I'll explain how it will work and how you can use it to discern what you should choose in the future, is as follows. So there's four layers to this framework. Well, the argument goes, it's a strategy hierarchy. So as a business, if you feel that your operations are working well and efficiently, at the bottom level, you're delivering value to your customers. That's the essential starting place. If you haven't got that, you haven't got anything else. Once you have this level of efficiency, and there's always opportunity for improvement using technology, of course, but you can start to think about new markets, products, and services. 
if you're able to deliver new market, uh, new products, new services to your clients, to your own broker networks, then it's arguable that you can start to think much more deeply about the customer experience, the client experience that you've got around that. And it's much, much harder to develop a very engaging experience. We talk about this and we hear about it from the, from the social side of things and engagement with your customers whereby you can make it relevant to them, you start to understand them, that's where data comes in. But it's much harder to create an engaging experience if the basics, the base model of delivering good service and, 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 and so on are not there. You can't do two if you haven't got four, is my argument. So the, the message around this is to contextualize your business. Think about where your most biggest bang for bucks are going to be in terms of room for improvement, whether it's at level four, level three, because you're looking to acquire new customers, or whether you're actually already ahead of that and uh, you're into trying to develop, develop a big range of cus customer engagement and experience. And the reason why that's important, because you can start to place decisions around what technology you adopt relevant against something like this will say those are the areas that I need to be focusing on from a strategic perspective. So if we turn our attention to how uh, an insurer has gone about applying this framework to their digital strategy, um, I know this is a bit of a busy slide, apologies for that, but this was a lot of work that they did. So they identified four key strategic areas as part of their digital strategy. Uh, access to services, pricing analytics, a focus on sales and engaging with brokers and clients. And they referenced each of those areas to the strategy framework that I've just mentioned. So no surprise, most of the effort where they're thinking about spending their time is on level four, which is getting the basic business model working really, really well. Level three, as you remember, was about growing, growing the business, and level two is about the customer, the client experience. And what they then did was identify, and you see them blocked out in red and blue, they identified those things that they felt made a, would give them an advantage in the market. There were the red blocks on there. And the blocks in blue were where they'd already had some broker feedback that they did need to improve their business. Now you'll notice there's a number of references to digital, there's a number of references to tools, and there's some references to data. And this is my main point to you. A digital stat strategy is very much about the way that you run your business. It's not about acquiring a new technology per se. The reason I've just circled the one on the right there is that the, um, the, that may be something that most people might attribute to being a digital strategy, the, uh, the concept of a portal and social profiling and so on. But my, that's my point here is that this, this approach in terms of what the insurer was trying to do was their representation of what digital meant for them. A very much more holistic, a very much more integrated way of looking at the business. And then from here, they then started the process of looking at what were the technologies that would enable and support some of these ambitions. But they placed those technologies against the framework because most of their effort was going to be at, at level four, which if you remember was the, the basic business model. Uh, another example, um, I don't actually think this is the right place to start, and you might find that surprising given that we're providing software, but this was a, uh, a, 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 a lens that the company wanted to apply because they said, I want to look at it through more of an integrated technology lens. So they, rather than thinking about it from a business uh, ambition and uh, capability perspective, they wanted to look at it purely through a, digital, a technology lens, and that's how they started to express some of their digital strategy. So you see the top layer is where they felt that they wanted to focus a lot of their uh, effort and spend on the digital experience. That was underpinned by uh, a number of layers of uh, <coughs> technology components that they wanted to source. This was for a new MGA, so they had the benefit of um, being able to choose from fresh, other than like a number of you that may already have got commitments on technology. Again, we referenced at the beginning in the objectives that a lot of these technologies can be um, provisioned from the cloud. Again, I know there's been a lot of discussion around cloud technologies, but the beauty of cloud is that it's basically a, a, a consumptive type model, so you only start to pay as much as you use, and it gives you the flexibility to, to start and stop things. Uh, and I'll reference that a little bit later when we talk about some of the things that Microsoft Azure has available. So again, I'm not going to dwell on these. It was really to give you some practical examples of actual companies that are trying to grapple with this rather complex problem of where do we start to use technology. And as, I, as a reference, there's one approach which is thinking about the, the capa business capability side. The other one is let's take a technology lens. I don't think this one is the right... Uh, this is a good place to get to. It's not the right place to start with. 
But those are two practical uh, examples that I wanted to share with you. And I suppose my message would be, as you move forward with your existing digital strategy and digital way of working, please do, and I'm sure you already do this, because um, uh, all of us, I think, if we're successful, have a level of cynicism and skepticism. Please do uh, uh, apply a hawkish filter to things you might hear from consultants. Um, this was an extract of a report from one of the global top tier firms. Down the left hand side they talked about what do you need to be a digital insurer. Uh, my argument would be well I think they're just talking about things that for the large part are already done. So there is a lot of noise out there and I think um, as Paolo has said it's, it's on the one hand very invigorating and exciting on the other hand I think it is difficult to discern. So for those of you that have been in business for many years you've got by a lot of what you do through good intuition uh, and what I might call the sniff test, there's still some of those basics apply, so don't, don't abandon those. And I think the other thing is, uh, I don't know where that's come up, oh, okay. So be honest in terms of your expectations. This is a, a digital maturity framework model that uh, Forrester, one of the um, technology analysts, have um, come up with. Uh, if you look at it, the key point to make, I don't know whether I've got a, uh, oh, there we go. So um, the key point to make is they will talk about how much online traffic or business are you getting. And if you're at the lower end of that scale, then you're largely your target should be around just improving your customer acquisition. If you're at the other end, uh, you're a pure or a predominantly online business, then your place that you should be focusing is around some of those higher levels that we talked about on the strategy pyramid around getting um, customer experience using Insight. One of our clients is um, ASOS, the online retailer. Um, they are looking to go from uh, level two in the pyramid, which is very highly engaged customer experience and engagement, uh, to become globally market distinctive. But that's because the majority, I mean, they, they're more than 50%, in fact, it's 100% of their business is, is online. So their actually ambitions are set very high what I would urge you to do is be honest with yourself in terms of where are you, in terms of where your revenue is coming from, and align your ambitions around using some digital technologies uh, appropriately to where your business is right now and where you anticipated it to be. I am very, very familiar with the fact that you know, there is high degree of value in personal relationships with your networks, with your clients. Um, you know, if we look at uh, examples such as the um, NFU, um, model they have relationships with their clients as agents going back generations and these things will not be easily or replaced by a online digital technology anytime soon so i would i would urge you just just to sorry just to uh, to, to think about where you're going to be over the next few years and then set your targets accordingly in terms of um, uh, what you should be looking to do with your digital technologies the other part of you being successful in the future you've already done tremendously well to get where you are clearly but the future is going to be about I think exploitation and experimentation so exploitation um, is uh, very much around using technology that's available at a price point that you could only previously ever dream about I've just given you an example here Paolo made reference to the fact that we all got a bit hot under the color around data analytics three years ago uh, they were very expensive data warehouses and data processing was very expensive Nowadays, uh, for example, Microsoft Azure, um, they allow you to buy into analytical processing capability and capacity at price points of a few tens of pounds per month. So for those of you that are looking to try and work uh, some ideas around how to improve your understanding of your, uh, uh, the policies that you're selling, the patterns, the brokers that are doing well and so on, there are services that you can buy now at price points, as I said, of li literally a few hundred or tens of pounds a month. So the, the point I'm making here is the technology that is available today is so powerful, but so cost effective, then there is no reason whatsoever why you shouldn't be uh, looking to do a lot more experimentation. I was having a conversation outside before we came in with a, a chap I met at a previous event and he was saying how do I persuade the board to make a decision to go more to be more ambitious around some of the things that could be done online uh, and, and I've been in that position myself multiple times I don't think there's, there's an education strategy there's a um, 
bring them a complete solution strategy and sell it, tell them it's all the due diligence have been done. I don't think either of those work. I think the thing that works best of all is to actually start trying some things in a fully uh, agreed and you know you're going to be trying an experiment and you're going to actually go for it and it's actually about spending a little bit of money because the technology is so much cheaper um, but actually starting to try and play around with some of the technologies that are around uh, that will help you in whatever layer you're focusing on whether it's running your business more efficiently whether it's acquiring new 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 clients customers whether it's trying to improve the experience uh, any of those layers are open to technology enablement, but the thing I would say to you is, is do experiment. Uh, this, uh, one of our um, uh, Instanda clients is uh, currently um, doing this through the concept of a future office. So they are thinking about how do their touch points with the brokers, how do their um, operations team improve their way of working, uh, how do they actually engage more effectively with some of the, uh, the back office functions? And they're looking to develop a future office, or they actually are working a future office, a model of how they would like the future to be, without having to commit huge amounts of resources and money into that area. And that's a good way to try out this experimentation. You see it in many, many other industries. And I can't speak for Instanda, but your colleagues who are uh, far more, far more um, long, longer in the market than we are may have... Um, some money set aside where they can support you with some of these um, proven concepts. So when I was actually in CIO roles, I would go to my suppliers and say, help us with this concept of a future office and give me your, one of your technologies for free uh, because I'd like to showcase it to my executives. It's amazing how your suppliers will jump to that opportunity. Not wishing to speak for SSP colleagues here. Um, uh, the other, uh, other way you can do it, I don't think this is terribly um, successful. Um, we have seen it in a number of companies. Uh, they're bringing in, um, I mean, you can see it with Aviva, for example. So Aviva have set up their digital garage in Hoxton. If you've been in that building, I don't know how many of you have, uh, but it's, we're certainly not dressed like we are. Um, they are in jeans, T-shirts. There's a younger Z, Z generation. Is it one? Z generation. Um, they, that, that place is full of vitality and vibrancy. Uh, they are giving them the remit to go and experiment and explore. They put a big budget behind it. Uh, by comparison, I would say that the, uh, you know, the, one of the big strengths of MGAs is your agility, as you clearly raised your hands and acknowledged earlier, uh, but you don't have the same amount of resources and budget. And the risk of just bringing in one or two people who are a little bit more savvy with digital technologies is that they, they don't feel that they've got the backing and commitment from you, so they'll just walk out the door and probably pop down to Aviva um, anyway. So you've got to be careful with that one, but it's an option. Um, and then the other thing about cloud technology, and this is just repeating perhaps, but the technologies that are available do allow you to switch them on and switch them off. Um, uh, Paolo, um, without speaking, I hope I don't mind me speaking for him, Paolo and, 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 and co. have made a huge impact. Uh, I think what they do is a fantastically helpful uh, service in terms of um, providing a perspective on the industry for us all. Uh, they're using a, a number of technology tools, uh, PASL is one of them, for example, and they're able to punch well above their weight. The cost of these things are very low, but they're able to create a big impact. And I certainly think that they have engaged a large number of people in the market. And it's the same for you as running your businesses. There are multiple technologies that are available that you can just switch on for a relatively low price and get going. My message to you, however, is make sure you've got some kind of framework, whether it's the strategy framework or whether it's your understanding of where your <coughs> biggest need is, to place the technology into that zone uh, rather than just randomly pick something because you like the fact that the sales guys are telling you the right things and the PowerPoint looks pretty. So just in summary, um, uh, not a large amount of time to try and get through this. I hope I've given you a, um, a, a reasonable perspective on how to approach um, thinking about digital. There is lots of choice, so I would advise get a framework in place. Whatever that framework is, it's your own internal <coughs> business framework, uh, and use a, a sense check to determine where you think you should apply the technology. And again, at this, on this theme of experimentation, I think the most successful companies are the ones that try things, sense and respond, see if it's working, and then try and, and, um, and adjust, which is why experimentation is so is so. Um, uh, so important. I think we, we work with a lot of the larger um, corporates and um, I would say the MGA community clearly as you've demonstrated over the last five plus years 
have got innate advantages against the larger organizations, which are you're generally smaller, more agile, your decision-making processes are much more uh, um, shorter. You, you, not always, but a number of you are owner-managed, so the owner can make a decision and everything goes. In corporate life, it's not like that at all. They are not able to respond to um, opportunities anywhere near as quickly as you can. They're not able to make decisions around technology anywhere near as quickly as you can. They're probably not able to be as clear in their own framework that they use. So you've got innate advantages on your side. So the things that have carried you to where you are, uh, I would urge you to continue with that agility and adaptation because the experimentation is your playground and it's not available to many other larger organizations. So it's a big opportunity for you. Um, the digital strategy, as I said, some businesses think of themselves as digital businesses rather than the, uh, having the strategy layered on top. And, and I, I wouldn't like to suggest whether that that's the way that you think about your organizations or not, but I would, I would give, you your, give yourself the challenge. Am I truly, really a digital business uh, or, 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 or not? And I think that fundamentally changes the direction of your thinking. Uh, and final close, uh, you know, there are substantial benefits um, from operating in a more, um, uh, a more technology enabled way. You know this, uh, you can have happier customers, increase your sales and reduce costs. These are obvious things. And again, we've got lots of evidence. I'm sure other technology suppliers equally uh, would have that. And I think, you know, the closing message I would give you is that you've got distinct advantages in the marketplace and you should see this era that we're in as absolutely giving you even more advantage than anybody else is going to be able to get because you're going to be able to actually grab hold of these opportunities and run with them in a way that others can't. So you should be actually, um, going back to the very, very beginning quote, uh, not feel lukewarm about digital strategy. You should feel ecstatic <laughs> because you're likely to be far more successful in adapting and, uh, and amending how it would work than any of the other players in the market. Uh, I don't quite see ecstasy, but I get <laughs> the feeling that maybe there's a few smiles. But anyway, um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. I'll sit down. I think there's some questions. About okay. Um, Tim, Paolo, thank you very much indeed. Um, certainly, uh, you've, you've left me quite confused. Uh, but um, questions from the floor. Who would like to start? Or is everyone as confused as I am? Andrew Smith, are there any threats out there if, if adopting a particular strategy and a particular solution to these, are there any threats of significant technological changes which might leave us with a big investment which we then have to throw away and start again? Uh, I think there's, um, sorry, was that to me or Paolo? Whoever, do you want me to go yeah, first? Yeah. It's, um, I, I've previously been uh, on the um, client side and I've, I've uh, have presented to boards about the fact that we needed to invest 20, 30, 40 million pounds in this particular enterprise-wide system, um, not in insurance, but in other industries that I've been in. And I, I think there is, um, and I think 10 or 15 years ago, they were pretty good, safe bets. Um, they do a job of really doing very well on transactional processing, and uh, you need... Um, sophisticated systems to handle large volume of transactions. And I think for the capacity supply side of the industry, I think it's difficult to see how that will change. I think the pressure that will come at them was, um, you know, so for example, I can use these names because they're, they're not so prevalent in insurance, but, uh, you know, whether you buy SAP or Oracle, you knew you were into um, 20, 30, 40 million pounds implementations, and, and, and I think that but they provided a service which was, processing those large volume of transactions. Since then, there are other solutions on the market that do as reasonably good job. SAP and Oracle would argue they're not, but they're at a price point much, much lower. So for example, you can buy um, uh, a software solution called NetSuite. It's a cloud-based ERP solution. Uh, NetSuite is probably about um, a 20th or 30th of, of the price that you could get for SAP or Oracle. And so in the large enterprise system space, I think that in the insurance area, there are some um, very successful incumbents. We can look at people like Duck Creek, Guidewire, uh, some of the very successful companies in, in the UK, Actress, SSP, and others. And those, those players will be around for a long time. I think their challenge will be there will probably be some arrivals in their space doing the full end-to-end -end at a price point that's probably significantly lower than 
than they currently offer. And, and I, but my, my message to any board making that decision would be don't choose those new, new providers until they've been established for several years because in the system transactional record end of things, you're, you're talking about a lot of risk management and you want surety on, on provision of service. So I think, I think I wouldn't be advising boards to change their dramatically. Their, and I wouldn't see a, a near-term threat in those transactional processing ends. The real interesting bit is when you move up the chain and start thinking about where do I need to become much more dynamic, whether it's in pricing or product placement or distribution or uh, um, um, web deployment. In those areas, um, uh, there is a need for having a lot more flexibility and being much more open to change. But the good news is the investment levels are much lower of what, what you can buy from a technology standpoint to, to deliver those things. Uh, and that, in fact, that's where Instanda comes in. We've aimed it at, not at the big heavyweight transaction end, but at something that's much more dynamic retail. And therefore, I think the risks are lower because whilst there'll be a lot of new arrivals in that space, I think the price points will be much lower. And I think companies just have to get used to hanging their hat on something and then in a, in a, in a relatively much more frequent level, possibly changing because something better's come along. From a client's perspective, or from a company's perspective, I think that's good news for you as long as you're adept at, at moving from one platform to another. And, and, and it becomes easier if you store your data in some kind of data warehouse or you've got your data stored somewhere else so that your main repositories are not tied up with those platforms. And then it's much easier to change. Um, so I think, in summary, big systems, well, I don't think they'll change that dramatically over the next few years. There will be some new arrivals. The more dynamic end of how you want to interact with your um, markets, those will change, and you should be looking to change those. And as long as you store your data in a, in a different place, then you, you can buy into that flexibility. Sorry, long answer, but... <laughs> no, fabulous. Um, anyone else for a moment? Okay. Actually, I've got a question for um, Paolo. Um, where do you see the ins insurance industry relative to um, other uh, financial service? The, the first thing to say is I think we need to consider it as two industries. So effect from, from the point of view of that question. So the personal line space is moving at a very different speed to the commercial line space for obvious reasons. The personal line space has had to engage on the use of technology for the, the interaction with the customer in a way that we haven't had to do in this building. And therefore, the, the mindset of the board who's being asked to invest £50 million in a new website means that they're ready and able to deal with the question about an investment in another type of technology as well. Whilst if you go to the, the average player on the commercial line side who's fundamentally been underwriting the same way for years, you, you don't have that kind of drive. So I think you could argue that, uh, for example, what we saw in the comparison websites in the personal line space over the last few years is, is cutting edge. You know, there is truly stuff being done there that, that for example, the, the retail shopping industry is, is behind on. Whilst on the commercial line side, I think we are behind in almost every way. I don't think our underwriters use data well enough. I don't think we communicate as a, uh, a, a set of stakeholders in the industry as well as almost any other industry. So I think that um, those of us in this building are, are way behind the curve. Some of those who are at the, the cutthroat, very tight margin edge in the personal line space are, are right at the forefront. And I suspect some of, of yourselves are sitting somewhere in the middle. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so really that just leaves it for me to thank everybody for coming today. Um, certainly I've learned something. Um, and so if we could just thank our guests in the normal way. Thank you. Thank you.